Hey guys, I'm Ava and let's talk about Pokemon. Today we are going to be talking about vintage packs because a lot of times people will talk about the returns on these products because they are very, very high. But I think we can put this into perspective because I want to show to you that just because something happened does not mean that that was the only possible outcome. And when we look at these returns, we have to account for the risk that you would have incurred by buying these packs in 1999 or 2000. Because think about it, you know, Pokemon is over 25 years old now. You know, these sets are over 22 years old now. You didn't know back when Pokemon first came out that it was going to become a mainstay and that it was going to be around for 25 years. If you had asked me if I'd been alive, because I'm a fetus, if I thought Pokemon would be around in 25 years, I probably would have said no. And I think saying that isn't the wrong answer because you look at all of these toys from the 90s or 2000, how many toy brands from back then are still around? How many are household names? How many can you name? I can't think of many. So we're gonna be talking about these products and I just have a few up here, for example, we're looking at the first three. I also made a spreadsheet with some more sets that's available on my Patreon. And I'm gonna be showing you guys how much I would have been willing to pay for these like if I were looking at it from an investing perspective back in 1999 and I can tell you for a fact that it's not going to be anywhere near this because we have to talk about the risk. So first off when we look at these returns they're pretty impressive. $350 by the way for all of these numbers we're using an MSRP of $399. It might have been a little bit cheaper back in 1999 but it doesn't really matter that much for the purposes of this illustration and also prices vary depending where you live so we're just going to use $399 for this. And we are also not going to be accounting for tax or inflation in this video, but because we are doing that across all the things we're going to be talking about, it'll be okay. And the logic and thesis of this video will still work out. So $350 for base set. These are all unlimited light packs, by the way, to keep it consistent. We have 185 for jungle, 165 for fossil. These are very, very impressive returns, right? You know, you look at these raw numbers, like Jesus Christ, it's over 8,000%. It's almost 9,000. We have 4,000 as our low end for fossil. And these obviously are all very, very impressive numbers. But this is over the course of over 20 years. So what happens if we annualize this? So do you guys know what these numbers in red are? I don't, so let me just put on my glasses. Okay, these are the annualized return. So this is going to be compounded annually. So this is CAGR, which is our compounded annual growth rate. So you can see for base, it's 21%. And for jungle and fossil, it is both about 18%. And this is because fossil came out later and that's how compounding growth works. It's been around for a shorter amount of time. And as time goes on, this 18%, I don't think it'll necessarily hold, but that's what it is right now. So. We have incurred a lot of risk for this. And this is above the performance of the S&P 500. I believe when I looked it was something like 7.34% from 2000 to 2022, which is not bad at all. That's not accounting for inflation, of course, but this isn't either, so we're being consistent there. 7.34% is not bad at all. And you know, you say this is higher and this looks like a good investment, but we have to account for the risk. It is much, much less risky to buy an ETF that tracks, you know, the S&P 500. It's so much safer than this that we have to account for that when we're looking at this number. So first, let's actually talk about a few companies. So we're going to be talking about some really classic companies. You know, these are some pretty quintessential ones. So we're going to be talking about Coca-Cola, Microsoft, and McDonald's, home of the, the McRib and the Whopper. You know, people love these places. So what's going to be interesting is I'm going to show you the returns from these and then we're going to talk about risk and how we can account for that when we're looking at this from a value investing perspective, because that is the perspective I come from. That's kind of what my profession is, I guess you could say. And I'm comparing these to stocks because that's what I know. You can compare these things to like real estate as well. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about in this video does apply to things like that as well. First up, Coca-Cola. This is a very classic pretty safe investment. So they average from 2000 to 2022 about 4.8% return, which by itself again isn't that much, but as we said, the risk is very low, but it also has a dividend and the dividend yield is currently 2.7%. This isn't necessarily gonna be the same throughout that entire history, not even just because of the dividend itself, but dividend yield depends on the price of the stock itself. So this probably varied but you know, we can say probably pretty safe that it was at least more like 6%. Microsoft was hit pretty hard right around 2000 because of the tech bubble. 
So they have averaged 11.6% from 2000 to 2022, but they also have a dividend as well, which is 0.089%. So we can say that this is definitely at least closer to 12%. Finally, we have McDonald's. You know, people really like McDonald's. Uh, it's a great real estate company. Um, you know, people like to get their, their Cokes. I hear it's pretty different at McDonald's and their fries and their Whoppers. So McDonald's has averaged 12.8%. That's pretty impressive, but it also has a 2.2% dividend. Not bad at all. That adds up. If we assume this is consistent throughout 15%, but we can say probably 14% and be safe. So 14% versus this 18%, not bad. But of course, this is compounded. So it really does add up to be quite a big difference over time because this 18% is over, over 20 years. That is very, very impressive. But also, let's talk about risk. So when we're looking at things from a investing perspective, something we care a lot about is called required rate of return. So this can also be your discount rate. These two things aren't necessarily always the same, but oftentimes they are. So required rate of return is the amount we expect our investment to return for us to be willing to take on the risk associated with that investment. So for something that's riskier, you should naturally have a higher required rate of return because certain things are much lower risk. Consider a treasury bond. That's often considered a risk-free investment or the risk-free rate, which is also used when you're figuring out your required rate of return and in particular your discount rate, it can be very useful for that. But in this video, we're not gonna to talk too much about that because uh, the method of calculating required rate of return and discount rate through that doesn't necessarily apply. So I'm quickly gonna show you what the formula is for required rate of return. It's gonna be our principal times one plus our required rate of return. So this is gonna be a percent and then raised to the period. So this is gonna be like 22 in our case. So our required return on that 399, so that's our principal, is gonna be one plus whatever we decide our required rate of return is, which we're gonna be talking about very soon, raised to the 20th, 22nd power. So you're gonna see that our required return is quite high. Now, when we talk about companies like this that are legitimate established companies, the required rate of return is gonna be much lower. A typical required rate of return ranges from something like seven to 12%. This is pretty typical, and the way that you can calculate this uh, most traditionally in value investing, particularly when we're talking about discounting, I'm also gonna explain what discounting is. Let me actually give you the worst explanation of discounting possible. I'm not used to explaining these things to people, but to do that, I think we're gonna need to put on our thinking caps. I have mine right here, and you can tell I've been thinking extra hard by the stain on it. So discounting is talking about future cash flows. When we're talking about value investing, what your goal is, is to figure out the intrinsic value of your investment, the thing you're looking at. So it could be a company. Now, the way this is calculated is by taking all future free cash flows. So that's basically how much the company is actually making. It's not the same as net income. It's really more like the amount of money the company has available to either reinvest in the business, return to shareholders, that type of thing. When uh, we're looking at a company at my job, the first thing that we ask, you know, aside from what the company does, we almost always ask when we're looking at a company is what's the free cash flow yield? So Free cash flow is going to be, you know, those future cash flows. It's how much the company's actually generating. Because if something's not making money, it's not worth money. And in the case of these packs, that can't quite apply because they aren't making money, which is why some people say these are worthless. They have an intrinsic value of zero. And I don't know if I necessarily disagree with that. Uh, it's really hard to say. And, you know, does happiness have value? I don't know. You could argue that it does. But for this purpose, you know, collectibles, things like art, we know they have value. There are things in the world that don't make money and have value. I think this is a well-known fact. So when we discount something, we are gonna discount it back to the present value. So today we live in 1999 or 2000. So our formula for this is gonna be free cash flow multiplied by one over one plus R. So this would really be discount rate, but for our purposes today, they are going to be the same. That means required rate of return and discount rate are gonna be the same for today. Not always true, but it can be. And so this is gonna be raised to the T power as well. So this is basically the inverse of this. That makes sense, I think. Now, free cash flow, in our case, we don't have free cash flow, but what we're gonna call uh, our free cash flow is gonna be our final payout 
in the year we're planning to sell. So this free cash flow is a prediction. So this is going to be our projection. Now, we have actual data on what that payout would be today, right? But we didn't know what it was back in 1999, 2000. You'd have to make guesses. And if you told me you thought that this would be $350 in 2022, I would think you're crazy. And I don't think I'd be wrong for thinking that. Uh, just because something worked out doesn't make it the right choice. You know, I think that's something fair to say. You know, there's nothing wrong, obviously, with investing in these things. That's what we're all doing here today. But let's go back to required rate of return because we're gonna figure out what the required rate of return should be for these things. Seven to 12% is typical. Things like a tech startup or something like that could be as high as 15%, which is very, very high. It doesn't sound like that much of a difference, but when you compound that over 20 years, it makes a massive difference, okay? So 15% is quite a high discount rate. Now, for something like Coca-Cola, our, our required rate of return is gonna be pretty low because it's an established company. We aren't incurring that much risk. So maybe it's closer to 7%. McDonald's is probably a little bit higher. So maybe we're gonna say 8%. These are of course off the top of my head. If you're figuring out required rate of return and discount rate the most, a uh, typical way to do it is through something like the CAPM method, which is capital asset pricing model. Uh, however, that doesn't really apply to trading cards. And there are also things like WAC, which is weighted average cost of capital. But we don't have those because we're talking about trading cards and those involve things like debt and whatnot, which really don't apply here. And if I'm being honest, in the several hundred models I've worked on, those have almost never come up. We usually come up with a discount rate depending on how we perceive the risk of the company to be. Because when you're working on these models all day, you don't have that much time necessarily to go through and try and figure these out, especially because we're doing a lot of quick analysis of many companies and then we go in depth on a few that seem worthwhile. So, you know, if you're trying to look at 20 companies or something and get a feel for them, it's just so much faster to do it that way. I know I'm gonna get a lot of hate in the comments for saying that, but that's just what my experience has been. So in Microsoft, it's gonna be a bit higher for sure than the other two. It's a tech company and it was 2000, you know, tech bubble just popped, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's maybe more like nine or 10%, something like that. So we'll just say it's nine to 10%. It doesn't really matter because uh, these numbers aren't too important. And you can see that these have pretty much all surpassed the required rate of return that we would expect. For Coca-Cola, it uh, is a bit closer, but if you add in the dividend, it does kind of work out. I don't like dividends uh, for the most part, but that's besides the point. Microsoft definitely did it. McDonald's fucking blew it out of the water because this is easily 14%. So very nice job on McDonald's part. Now, what about Pokemon cards? We really can't be using the CAPM model or things like that to figure out our discount rate. Our required rate of return is gonna be much more subjective based on our personal beliefs and our personal perception of the risk. Now, this is certainly a high risk investment. Again, what is the success rate of investing in collectibles from the 90s? How many toys and collectibles from 1999 or 2000 can you name? How many are worth significantly more? If you told me that you thought Pokemon cards would be a good investment, I would assume you mean like $20 per pack in 2022, which is generous, but 350, 185, 165 is remarkable. So I think that 15% is actually gonna be a fair discount rate in this case, a fair required rate of return, if you will. So what does that mean exactly? Well, we're gonna look at Fossil. We're just gonna pick on Fossil. It's the newest and it's just interesting. You know, base set has an advantage being the very first set that came out, but let's talk about fossil. And this is unlimited base set, just so you know. So we're going to first figure out what we would expect fossil to be worth using this required rate of return in 2022. So that is going to look something like this. It's going to be $3.99, right? Because that is our MSRP. That's going to be our principal. You know, we're not going to be including tax in this. Let's just assume we live in uh, Texas. I'm pretty sure they don't have sales tax. So I could be wrong on that. Feel free to yell at me if I am. Now, one plus our required rate of return, that's gonna be one plus 0.15. And then the power here I think is 22.5. I did this math out on a spreadsheet with the exact dates. So I, the number will be correct. This might just be slightly off. It might be like 22.6, 22.4, something like that. But very, uh, very big number that we get out here. Would you like to take a guess? We did meet that because it makes sense because it's 18%, it's about 15%, but it is $92 and 60 cents. Whoa, 
That's a big number. That's a really freaking big number. Now, if you were going to buy this, actually looking at it from like a rational perspective saying, I'm going to buy these Pokemon cards and hold them till 2022. You know, maybe you say, oh, I'm going to buy them and sell them in a few years. But we have to talk about the time horizon because this is a very long time horizon. And you also have this money locked up in that for 22 years, by the way. Now, $92.60. Now, I don't believe that most people looking at this from a rational, you know, more value investing mindset would have actually told you this is worth $92.60. You know, a lot of people would tell you it's worth zero because again, no free cash flow. But that could be a whole other video in and of itself because I've read a lot of interesting articles talking about how collectibles have no uh, intrinsic value, which I think definitely can be rebuttaled, especially when we actually look at history. But these prices are indeed crazy. So I understand why people are skeptical of it and I am as well. So very, very high, unreasonably high. I would not have invested in this. If this were my required rate of return, I would not believe this. So that immediately to me is a big red flag. You know, I don't think that this, you know, makes that much sense. It's these returns are crazy. We can actually also do some pretty fancy math to figure out what we would call the intrinsic value of this pack back in 1999. So if I were a value investor and I believed this were worth $165, that that's what that would sell for, we can use this formula right here to figure out what it would have been worth back in 1999. And we can also kind of use this in a retrospective way. Keep in mind, hindsight is 2020. We have knowledge that we wouldn't have had. That's really an important part of this video. We know things that people didn't know back in 1999. And it's a lot of things that don't make sense. A lot of times the thing that happens in life is the thing that makes the least sense. So we're going to use this and we're going to multiply our final payout, 165, what we think it will sell for, by our discount factor. This second term here is called the discount factor. And the further time goes out, the tinier it becomes, which also makes sense. And we're gonna talk about that really quickly just because I think it's very interesting. So one over one plus 0.15, and then this is gonna be something like 22.5. Now, before I show you what that is, uh, the reason it makes sense for this discount factor to get smaller as time goes on is because if you don't discount these, and you're trying to figure out the present value of a company, you'll have kind of an infinite value. Let's say I think that McDonald's is gonna be in business forever because people are so addicted to their uh, McRibs and Coke that it will be around for like a million years. Now, if I say that and I don't discount these based off of a factor, based off of time, if you add those terms up, it could approach infinity if we assume it'll be around forever. Because when we calculate these, we do so into perpetuity. So this is a big thing in value investing because, you know, we can't, can't really predict when a company is going to go out of business. So we do it into perpetuity. But the reason it doesn't matter we do it into perpetuity is because we are discounting by this time factor here. As this number approaches infinity or even something like, you know, 100, this is going to, this term, this discount factor is going to approach zero right? And because that approaches zero, this whole term approaches zero. Because when we are calculating the sum of these free cash flows, you know, it's a lot of different terms. And we have to discount them back to present value. And when we do so, we're actually able to get a pretty interesting intrinsic value. Again, intrinsic value, it's based off of projections and predictions. So it is not, of course, necessarily true. That's, of course, you know, a big part of value investing. You have to be really accurate with your projections. Otherwise, your whole result will be very, very skewed. And it's important to be realistic and conservative. But this will come out to... For those of you who can't read my bad handwriting, that says $7.10. That's not a lot of money. That is not a lot of money at all. $7.10 is what this really would have been worth. Assuming somehow I come up with this as what I think it's going to be worth in 2022, which you're crazy if you did probably. This is what it's worth back then, accounting for this risk. That is crazy, right? So, you know, this is more than the MSRP. So it's true that they're undervalued. This again is a big thing in value investing. We talk about whether things are over undervalued or fairly valued. This would be undervalued according to our model but it's not by that much. So we can actually calculate how undervalued this is by a fairly simple, <laughs> by a fairly quick and simple uh, calculation. 
So it's just going to be 1 minus our $3.99 divided by our $7.10. And this comes out to approximately 43.8%. So this 43.8% is how much we would say this is undervalued by. Let's actually put this in red for, you know, drama. I'm struggling over here. So we're putting this in red for some, for some extra drama. 43.8%. That's not that much. I mean, if we're talking about companies, that's a lot. And it is kind of a lot um, in general. But it's not something that I've never seen before. It's not something I've never seen with actual companies. You can look at distressed businesses, things that were hit hard by some type of macroeconomic situation. Think about 2008, 2000. There are a lot of companies that are hit really hard, even though they are generating the free cash flow to make them a good investment, to make them undervalued. Uh, and those companies have actual free cash flow. Again, the risk on this is very high. Just Adding this 15% isn't enough to account for risk if it's a like you know one in 1,000 thing. You have to be aware of that as well. This is not a substitute for risk. You can't just say this and then not account for risk. That's still true because we have to also think about our scenarios. So there's a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, and then kind of the expected. So this would be called like our bull, bear, and base case scenarios. My bear case on this would be that these are worth like... 50 cents to the right person who has nostalgia for it but they might be like junk really my base case maybe like i don't know it could be that they've appreciated somewhat or they're just stuck at msrp maybe there's inflation so maybe they're worth like five to ten dollars that's gonna be our bear and then our bull would be like what 20 bucks that seems pretty fair to me that seems pretty generous so 20 dollars is our bull case scenario that's pretty different than what we've actually seen. Now, the thing about this that's interesting is that we're using this in a retrospective way. And I'm using this in a retrospective way because it's very hard to kind of actually quantify, you know, these returns when we're talking about risk. I don't really think I've seen anyone do it, which is also why this methodology is pretty rough. It's something I'm kind of working on and trying to figure out just by myself because I haven't seen anyone else do this. Not to flex, but I am a genius, thank you. So. The thing is, we can use this going forward too. You know, these are normally used as projections. We're using it retrospectively because this is the best framework that I've come up with uh, to kind of analyze these and put into perspective these returns. But the cool thing is using these to project forward because this information is very interesting, but it's not useful necessarily because we can't go back to 1999. We can only live in the present because we're living in this future, right? You know, we're living when the future free cash flow would be. But we do live in 2022 and there are new Pokemon products coming out all the time. And of course, you could apply this to the prices these are currently at, but that's not the purposes of this video. So we can apply this going forward, which is really cool. And maybe our discount rate isn't 15% anymore. Maybe it's 12%. You know, very it's a high end of risk, but it's a bit more established. Pokemon has been around for 25 years. You know, it's got a global presence. And so maybe we could say something like, 12%. That gives us, you know, a lower required rate of return. We don't have to hit this 18%. And again, by the way, 18% minus 15%, that's like a 3% difference. Obviously, this is compounded and that's not precise. But this is more than that. McDonald's, technically, it outperformed the required rate of return more than Pokemon did. Assuming that these uh, are fair required rate of returns. Again, they're off the top of my head. But when we apply this going forward, it's going to be really interesting because we can apply this to pretty much any Pokemon product, a single, a set. You know, we can say that singles have a higher required rate of return than sealed product because they have higher risk. And that just makes sense, right? I think that's really cool. And it's also going to help show why an important part of when we're thinking about what we're going to invest or speculate in with Pokemon is considering that the price we're actually paying. When we're looking at companies for my job, you know, we're doing value investing. There are so many great companies that are just overvalued, you know, because the market knows they're great. But uh, the way that value investors can outperform is when they find things that people aren't appreciating. If we can find something that's undervalued, that's how we outperform. That's how we gain that extra couple percent. And that's how we maintain a margin of safety. 
you know, it's very difficult to do that in Pokemon. But if you are responsible and pay attention to the prices you're actually paying and keep your expectations in line, you know, when I say I believe in modern sealed product, I'm not talking about 100% annual returns, you know, I'm talking, you know, closer to this 10, maybe 15% return. So what I'm kind of getting at is things like Evolving Skies, you know, I hate to pick on it, but I really don't hate to pick on it. It's so expensive. You're not <laughs> looking at it from a value investing perspective. You're looking at it from an emotional perspective all the time, the people who are buying this. And I don't think that's the right way to go about it. If we're trying to invest, we have to look at things logically. Paying half the price for Fusion Strike is in my eyes worth it because the risk is so much lower. Even if in the long run, Evolving Skies does potentially outperform, there's like no margin of safety right there. Basically none. And Fusion Strike, you're buying below MSRP. The most important thing in investing is not to maximize your upside, it's to minimize your downside. This, I think, just goes to show that you know, you can get a really good upside, but there's also the downside potential, right? This is what happened. But if we looked at things like Beanie Babies, it would be a totally different story. I don't know, Furbies, I don't think those are popular anymore. Trolls, maybe, I don't know, but probably not that good. Uh, so hopefully this was interesting. Again, you know, I've never talked about this before, so my explanations are terrible and you can rake me in the comments. Please comment below anything, uh, you know, for the algorithm. Tell me what your favorite product from McDonald's is. Is it the Whopper, the McRib? Go for it. You know, go ham in the comments. And also, if you guys enjoy this type of content, I do think it's pretty original if I'm being honest. And here comes the shameless self promo, which is that I have a Patreon. Feel free to click the link in the pinned comment and join me. I have made a longer post about this where I have written out my thoughts and maybe they're mildly more cogent than this. And I've also included a few more packs and I'm thinking about expanding that spreadsheet. So if any of my patrons would like any additional sets included, I can do that for them as well. And if you want to support me in a way that is entirely free to you, I also have some eBay and Amazon affiliate links in that same pinned comment. If you probably just click the show more button or whatever, they'll probably be there. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, especially to my patrons and in particular, the squander of my life and of course, Mythic Timmy. Thank you guys so much for watching. And of course, this is not financial advice. Why would you listen to a girl with a stained hat rambling on YouTube? I fucking wouldn't. Ignore this whole video. I will see you guys next time.